There can be no society without a shared memory of its history, where it has been, what are its core values and aspirations, who have been its architects. The Eminent Caribbean Juris Awards was conceptualized in 2019 to recognize and celebrate those outstanding jurists who by dint of their brilliance, hard work and determination have made a consequential contribution to Caribbean society. The 2021 installation of these awards pays homage to pioneering Caribbean women jurists who have built and are building the Caribbean society through their contributions to legal activism, adjudication, corporate governance, education, politics, and public service. These are women who have shattered glass ceilings and who have blazed an inspirational trail for the younger generation and indeed for all of us to follow. The head of state is the highest representative of our sovereign states. We honor those women who have come to embody and symbolize the unity and integrity of our Caribbean nations at home and abroad. Her Excellency Paula May Weeks is the sixth and current president of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. She became the first woman to occupy that role when she assumed office on March 19, 2018. Her roles as prosecutor, defense attorney, criminal judge, and justice of appeal over the course of a 30-year career made her a well-known and highly respected figure by the time of her nomination to the presidency in January 2018. Her Excellency came from a very diverse background in terms of she would have had a lot of experiences at school. She went to a school that promoted um, all around learning, not just academics, but otherwise as well. And it was there she developed a lot of languages among other pursuits. And so she thought that being a linguist would be a good idea. She'd be able to travel, living in a, a different country. That was the adventurous Paula May Weeks. Well, I have to tell you that I really never had any interest in being an attorney at law. My interest was being, in, being a linguist. What I wanted to do was to go and live and work in Martinique. My mother, however, found that that was too much of an airbrain scheme and used her brothers together to show me the wisdom of going to university since I could matriculate. And so I went off there and uh, not every topic or every subject was of interest to me. In fact, I laugh today when I think that the course I hated most of all in my three years at the university was constitutional law. I think God really does have a sense of humor. Her Excellency had a very rich background growing up. Um, she had a very comprehensive education at high school as well as at university. And so when she stepped into the director of public prosecutions, that role, um, she really took to it. It took her all across the country. Um, and so she began to see not only um, people's uh, experiences, but also you know their, their struggles. She heard their stories. Um, and she really began to understand the nature of the work. And so then when she further stepped out and became a defense attorney, that's when she really um, began to understand the full scope of the law. She was now on the other side of the table. And so becoming a judge, it was a very natural fit for her because she was able by then to have a comprehensive view and understanding of, 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 of the law, of people's experiences, of what it meant um, to, to, to practice and, and, and to be a lawyer. But when I went to the DPP's department, even though there was no structure in place, what we had, when I joined, let me say this, the only other woman there was Dana Sitahal. And we were among a group of much older men. First of all, they all treated us with great respect. There was no slack talk to us from them. And they were always ready to discuss a point. So it was never sit down and bring your books and take notes. 
but they will point us to authorities. They would give us examples of their own experiences in certain matters. And we would take it from there. So there was always this provision of guidance. And if you could call it that disorganized fashion, but it certainly played a great role in giving us ideas and guidance and support because you often needed that sometimes you would come back from court fairly battered and just the hair don't worry about it tomorrow is another day you're going to fight again you know she's known for not necessarily being someone who likes to be in the public eye um, and being a single woman, um, I think that is something that has always been part of her personality. And she has brought that to office. She's more about the business of the job, getting the job done, what needs to be done at the office, what needs to be done in accordance with her role and functions as outlined by the Constitution. In 20, I think it may have been about 14 or 13, I taught a course for judges in the conduct of a criminal trial for the Eastern Supreme Court. And apart from the judges who worked in those courts, they invited a number of chief justices from various jurisdictions. There I became reacquainted with the chief justice of Turks and Caicos. I had met her in 2012 in Uganda at a conference. And she asked me whether I would consider coming to serve on their court of appeal. She thought I could come even though I was working as an appellate judge in Trinidad, because there are jurisdictions in the Caribbean where a judge can take vacation and work in another jurisdiction as a judge. So that didn't apply to Trinidad and Tobago, so I told her, well, I can't even consider it. And then when she heard I had retired in 2016, she immediately contacted me again and asked me whether I would. So I said, listen, I have just retired. I don't want to take on another yoke. So when she explained that it was only three weeks at a time for a maximum of three to four times a year, I thought, okay, that's very doable. I retired seven years before the mandatory retirement age. And so I never intended to sit in a rocking chair. I just did not want to have a, a full-time job in a judiciary anymore. And so it was not difficult at all to say yes to the Turks and Caicos position, which I could mix with my consultancy, but still call the shot, so to speak, in respect of how my time would be employed. And one of the unfortunate aspects of our history is that oftentimes it's not collected and it's just left un uncollected, unsaid, unwritten. And so I think it's a really good thing that um, this information has been collated into one spot. So we have the information about the women who would have shaped our present and who continue to inspire young girls um, in the future as well. Dame Sandra Prunella Mason. On January 8, 2018, Dame Sandra Mason was sworn in as Barbados's 8th Governor General. As a jurist, she reached the zenith of her career in 2008, when she was appointed the first female Justice of Appeal in Barbados. While still in that role, she was elected to serve on the Commonwealth Secretariat Arbitral Tribunal, leaving as President where she was called to higher office. With a profound sense of commitment to public service, Dame Sandra has embraced the enormity of the high office of Governor General to be the representative of all Barbados and all Barbadians. Our country can be in no doubt about its capacity for self-governance. The time has come to fully leave our colonial past behind. Barbadians want a Barbadian head of state this is the ultimate statement of confidence in who we are and what we are capable of achieving. Hence, Barbados will take the next logical step towards full sovereignty and become a republic. By the time we celebrate our 55th cent anniversary of independence. Now, recently, I think a week or so ago, uh, she, Dame Sandra, was uh, awarded the honorary degree 
doctors of law at, of the University of the West Indies. Dem Sandra is Her Majesty, if you like, Her Majesty's representative in Barbados. Now we are planning to go the route of Republic. And uh, Dame Sandra, after serving four years as um, Governor General, has been nominated to be our first uh, uh, president. So uh, you can see that all of that really points in one direction. That is that people, the common man and the average Barbadian uh, see Dame Sandra as uh, representing uh, everything that they believe in. And I, I think that one word uh, sums up all of that, and that is humility. But at that time in 1970, um, we thought, and I'm sure this was throughout the whole Caribbean, that it was time for us to assert ourselves. And as one of our national heroes said, it was time for us to stop loitering on the doorsteps of our colonial masters. We had proved that we were competent. So um, having the, um, the law faculty, as I said, sort of completed the circle. And I don't even think that any of the students who entered entertained even a scintilla of doubt. Of course, there was a plethora of doubting Thomases outside that um, arena. They, they doubted whether um, the UWI would be able to succeed in this faculty, despite the, the, the successes we had had previously in the other disciplines. There was doubt whether we would be accepted by the, the region and things like that. But we ourselves, we guinea pigs as we were called, we pioneers, as I, I think is the more appropriate term, um, we didn't entertain any such doubt. We recognized almost from the first morning that we had a, a trail to blaze and I think we settled down and blazed that, that trail. And of course, you would know that since um, 1975, when we were the first group at who had qualified, we have come a long way. We have proved to any doubting Thomases that they might have been that we could hold our own and hold our own we have done in the past 50 years or so. Dame Sandra believes in giving back to society. She's, she always claims that she has benefited so much from society uh, and that she owes it to the public to give back as much as she as she she can so that was a fascinating one of the fascinating things about uh, my research uh, that I found about Dame Sandra. As you would know um, education in Barbados is free totally free we like to say from the from the cradle to the grave and you can achieve anything you want and because of that, I felt it's incumbent upon me, and I think it's incumbent upon me, and everybody who has had the benefit of free education to give something back. I'm a zealot when it comes to Caribbean-ness. I believe in regional integration. I believe that it is something that has to come to fruition. Uh, you might not know, but I was on the, um, the, uh, the commission when we were looking at um, West Indian Commission and we were looking at the question of regional integration. And we had gone throughout the Caribbean and to parts of the diaspora and trying to understand how, how the populace felt about this, this animal called integration. And it was significant, it was really an eye opener that with the exception of the politicians, all the co countries that we have gone to, they believe in regional integration. But how are we going to get there is another thing. But I believe it might not come in the true form while I am yet alive, but I will go to my grave hoping that this will, um, this will happen someday. Haiti's first woman president hailed from humble beginnings. Life wasn't easy, but a sense of education was instilled in her from a young age, leading her to become a woman of many firsts. She made a name for herself in the legal profession and became a prolific writer in her field. The first woman justice in the Supreme Court of Haiti was called upon to steer her homeland through the transition from dictatorship to democracy, and she accepted the job in the name of Haitian women. You know, in order to get a sense of who Eartha Pascal True is, you have to put her in the context of Haiti and, and Haitian society and Haitian politics. 
um, Haiti is, you know, in the Caribbean, we are very male dominated in terms of our politics, right? But in Haiti, it is more so. I think you have to think of Haiti as sort of a cross between the Latin culture and the English culture and taking that whole machissimo male dominated. So imagine um, this young woman, because she was what, in her thirties, um, thrown into the spotlight and thrown into the circle of, you know, where politics rules the day and you look around and all you see you know, are men. And, and, and I often say that, you know, Haitian men, they, they value strong women, but they don't necessarily want them in their kitchens or their bedrooms. And they certainly don't want them in the, in, in, in the palace. And so when you just think about the fact that she managed to survive that, and, and, and to get through that, you know, whatever history is going to say about what she did or didn't do as president, I think that in and of itself is accomplishment. But what you found, what I found is somebody who's very humble, um, someone who again felt that there was a calling. She did it out of a sense of duty for her country. Uh, again, this was not her dream. This was not her, her, her vision, but she was in a position to, to provide a service to be a benefit, you know, to her country. And, and that's where she stands. And she's very, she has a very strong faith in God. Um, she's, she's very deeply, you know, her deep beliefs. Uh, and, and that is what always, you know, guides her. And she says, look, if God were to give me a calling again, but I don't hear that calling. And so, so that is very much the base for her and the basis for um, everything that she's done. With my interview with um, Eartha Pascal Trujillo, it became very clear that she was the reluctant president. Um, it, there's a, been a lot that has been written about her, uh, but very rarely in terms of a theme emerging. And so when she and I spoke, one of the things that she kept coming back to was that this was not her dream. This was not the dream of a little girl to grow up and become president of her country one day. And that she was sort of thrown into this role to be the provisional president who would eventually usher in Haiti's first democratic elections because frankly, everybody on the Supreme Court turned down the job. And she happened to have been uh, the only woman on the court, the first woman. And at the same time, she was also kind of like the last in the line. And so when they came to her, um, this group, basically looking to put in a provisional president, um, whatever it is that they had in their mind, it was like, okay, you, you need to do this. And so this is why she was the reluctant president, because even then um, she didn't just jump up at the opportunity and say, okay, I, I am going to do it. It was something that uh, she'd given a lot of thought to, but when you look at her career and her path, clearly she had been prepared for this moment. You know, Haiti is a very um, complex, complicated, volatile country. Uh, and it has gone through various trans transitions um, since becoming independent. And again, you know, Eartha Pascal Trio stepped into this job. A lot of people did not know who she was. Um, they celebrated the moment by virtue of the fact that she was a female um, and probably because she was an outsider to some degree, but she also understood that this was a country that was traumatized, still going through trauma, a country with a lot of needs. And while her main goal and her main mission was to usher in these democratic elections, she also needed to address some of the social issues. You know, it's hard to tell people you should go vote if they're hungry. And of course, when you are the president, people are looking up to you for everything. 
So she decided that she would use um, her salary and the money that was being given, you know, for the palace to basically provide some assistance uh, to the poor. And in some ways, very much became sort of like the social service agency. She also realized that the palace guards were not being paid. Uh, she also provided funding for that. One can argue that it was to prevent a coup against her, of, of, of course, by keeping them, you know, by trying to keep them happy. But I think that it was also a way to sort of pacify um, a population. And again, she wasn't able to help everybody, but the fact that she just felt the need to, and let me just say this, one of the things that she shared with me was that when she left office, she was broke. She, she had nothing. I mean, there was assumptions by people, you're the president of a country, so you're rich, you may have, you know, increased your wealth, but uh, she financially had nothing and was most likely worse off than when she went into office. Again, you know, you've been thrown and jailed, you, you've been accused of, of, of a crime. Um, you don't really get a thank you. The international community had to, had to step in uh, and, and, and sort of rescue you in some sense. Uh, she quietly slipped out of Haiti. I, rem I remember that when she, when she left, uh, there was a lot of press reports at the time and Trump people trying to figure out exactly, you know, whether she was in Miami or New York. Um, so, but she had been working on a project before all of this uh, with her late husband. And it was like a bibliography and an encyclopedia of, of who's who in, in, in Haiti's history. And so essentially she devoted the last years of her life. She just completed it um, amid the pandemic, um, which is this huge, several volume encyclopedia. And at the time there was an interview with her where she was asked whether she would include herself. And she was still president at that time. And she said, no, she would not. She just thought it was too gratuitous and, and, and everything. But I think being out of office and seeing a lot that was written about her, some of it was erroneous. Uh, she did include herself um, in this bibliography because she wanted to, to set the record straight you know, from her words on, on, on who she is and her role in Haiti's history and, and what she brought to that. So she's an author, she's a writer. I mean, she wrote before she, you know, came, came into um, the presidency. Uh, she continued to do that. One of the interesting things when I was interviewing her, I said, you know, one of the things that I keep seeing coming up is you're almost like a feminist. You know, you're you're this female activist. But what? But she shied away from that. And, and that's another thing. She sort of shies away from from labels or being put into into a box. But I think it's also because this is who she is. Uh, when you look at the, the trends in terms of what she wrote about, they were very much about the social construct, the, the, the role of, of, of women in society, the family in society, and in terms of law. So these are things that were very important to her, and she just encompasses as part of who she is, not necessarily that she's leading a campaign of change. And this has to be something that's going to remain there, you know, for posterity. And I felt very happy to be part of that because, you know, we are not known in the Caribbean for documenting our history, our people, our awards even, right? In this very organized way so that people can look back at it later on. 50 years from now and see basically who was alive then and what they were doing and perhaps i don't know the hope is that it will bring some degree of pride and inspiration to those who follow eminent is is a term that i cannot i cannot equate to myself I, it's not a, a um an epithet that I would have used for myself. To be a part of this sort of recording of history is good for me. And um, I am hoping that say my grandchildren um, in the years to come will say, oh, grandma did all these things. Perhaps I shall have to outdo her. She's a very private person and she often doesn't give interviews. So the fact that she, you know, 
agreed to this interview, uh, to agree to be featured in this project was something that she welcomed warmly. And she's very proud of the fact that, you know, she's remembered and, and, and what she did in that time that it's being appreciated. One of the things which has intrigued me is the fact that we have a rich judicial history, a history of, of, of jurists of the highest order. But you look for any writings on our jurists, you don't find it. You can go to England, you can go to the, to the US and so on, and you'll find things written. So I agree with you that this, this, this work, uh, I think, is of seminal importance. Mm -hmm.